My Roomie by Ring Lardner. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. No, I ain't signed for next year, but there won't be no trouble about that. The dough part of it is all fixed up. John and me talked it over, and I'll sign as soon as they send me a contract. All I told him was that he'd have to let me pick my own roommate after this and not sick no wild man onto me. You know, I didn't hit much the last two months of the season. Some of the boys I noticed wrote some stuff about me getting old and losing my batting eye, and that's all bunk. The reason I didn't hit was because I wasn't getting enough sleep, and the reason for that was Mr. Elliot. He wasn't with us after the last part of May, but I roomed with him long enough to get the insomni. I was the only guy in the club game enough to stand for him, but I was sorry afterward that I'd done it, because it sure did put a crimp in my little old average. And do you know where he is now? I got a letter today, and I'll read it to you. No, I guess I better tell you something about him first. You fellas never got acquainted with him, and you ought to hear the dope to understand the letter. I'll make it as short as I can. He didn't play in no league last year. He was with some semi-pros over in Michigan, and somebody writes John about him. So John sends Needham over to look at him. Tom stayed there Saturday and Sunday, and seen him work twice. He was playing the outfield, but as luck would have it, they wasn't a fly ball hit in his direction in both games. A base hit was made out his way, and he booted it and that's the only reward Tom could get on his fielding. But he wallops two over the wall in one day, and they catch two line drives off him. The next day he gets four blows, and two of them is triples. So Tom comes back and tells John the guy is a whale of a hitter, and as fast as Cobb, but he don't know nothing about his fielding. Then John signs him to a contract, 1200 or something like that. We'd been in Tampa a week before he showed up, then he comes to the hotel and just sits round all day without telling nobody who he was. Finally, the bellhops was going to chase him out, and he says he's one of the ball players. Then the clerk gets John to go over and talk to him. He tells John his name and says he hasn't had nothing to eat for three days because he was broke. John told me afterward that he drew about 300 advance last winter sometime. Well, they took him in the dining room, and they tell me he inhaled about four meals at once. That night, they roomed him with Heine. Next morning, Heine and me walks out to the grounds together, and Heine tells me about him. He says, Don't never call me a bug again. They got me rooming with the champion of the world. Who is he, I says. I don't know, and I don't want to know, says Heine. But if they stick him in there with me again, I'll jump to the Federals. To start with, he ain't got no baggage. I asked him where his trunk was, and he says he didn't have none. Then I asked him if he didn't have no suitcase, and he says, No, what do you care? I was going to lend him some pajamas, but he put on the shirt of the uniform John gave him last night and slept in that. He was asleep when I got up this morning. I seen his collar laying on the dresser, and it looked like he had wore it in Pittsburgh every day for a year. So I throwed it out the window, and he comes down to breakfast with no collar. I asked him what size collar he wore, and he says he didn't want none because he wasn't going out nowhere. After breakfast, he beat it up to the room again and put on his uniform. When I got up there, he was looking in the glass at himself, and he done it all the time I was dressing. When we got out to the park, I got my first look at him. Pretty good-looking guy, too, in his uni. Big shoulders and well put together. Built something like Heine himself. He was talking to John when I come up. What position do you play? John was asking him. I play anywhere, says Elliot. You're the kind I'm looking for, says John. Then he says... He was an outfielder up there in Michigan, wasn't you? I don't care where I play, says Elliot. John sends him to the outfield and forgets all about him for a while. Pretty soon Miller comes in and says, I ain't gonna shag for no bush outfielder. 
John asked him what was the matter, and Miller tells him that Elliot ain't doing nothing but just standing out there, that he ain't making no attempt to catch the fungos, and that he won't even chase them. Then John starts watching him, and it was just like Miller said. Larry hit one pretty near in his lap, and he stepped out of the way. John calls him in and asks him, Why don't you go after them fly balls? Because I don't want them, says Elliot. John gets sarcastic and says, What do you want? Of course we'll see that you get anything you want. Give me a ticket back home, says Elliot. Don't you want to stick with the club, says John. And the busher tells him, no, he certainly did not. Then John tells him he'll have to pay his own fare home, and Elliot don't get sore at all. He just says, well, I'll have to stick then because I'm broke. We was having batting practice, and John tells him to go up and hit a few. And you ought to have seen him bust them. Lavender was in there working, and he'd been pitching a little all winter, so he was in pretty good shape. He lobbed one up to Elliot, and he hit it way up in some trees outside the fence, about a mile, I guess. Then John tells Jimmy to put something on the ball. Jim comes through with one of his fast ones, and the kid slams it again the right field wall on a line. Give him your spitter, yells John, and Jim handed him one. He pulled it over first base so fast that Bert, who was standing down there, couldn't hardly duck in time. If it had hit him, it had killed him. Well, he kept on hitting everything Jim gave him. And Jim had something, too. Finally, John gets Pierce warmed up and sends him out to pitch, telling him to hand Elliot a flock of curveballs. He wanted to see if left-handers was going to bother him. But he slammed them right along, and I don't believe he hit more than two the whole morning that wouldn't have been base hits in a game. They sent him out to the outfield again in the afternoon, and after a lot of coaxing, Leach got him to go after fly balls. But that's all he did do, just go after him. One hit him on the bean, and another on the shoulder. He run back after the short ones, and way in after the ones that went over his head. He catched just one, a line drive that he couldn't get out of the way of, and then he acted like it hurt his hands. I come back to the hotel with John. He asked me what I thought of Elliot. Well, I says, he'd be the greatest ball player in the world if he could just play ball. He sure can bust them. John says he was afraid he couldn't never make an outfielder out of him. He says, I'll try him on the infield tomorrow. There must be some place he can play. I never seen a left-hand hitter that looks so good again left-hand pitching. And he's got a great arm. But he acts like he'd never saw a fly ball. Well... He was just as bad on the infield. They put him at short, and he was like a sieve. You could have drove a hearse between him and second base without him getting near it. He'd stoop over for a ground ball about the time it was bouncing up against the fence, and when he'd try to cover the bag in a peg, he'd trip over it. They tried him at first base, and sometimes he'd run way over in the coacher's box, and sometimes out in right field looking for the bag. Once Heine shot one across at him on a line, and he never touched it with his hands. It went bam, right in the pit of his stomach, and the lunch he'd ate didn't do him no good. Finally, John just give up and says he'd have to keep him on the bench and let him earn his pay by busting him a couple of times a week or so. We all agreed with John that this bird would be a whale of a pinch hitter, and we was right, too. He was hitting way over 500 when the blow-off come, along about the last of May. Before the training trip was over, Elliot had roomed with pretty near everybody in the club. Heine raised an awful holler after the second night down there, and John put the bug in with Needham. Tom stood him for three nights. Then he doubled up with Archer, and Schulte, and Miller, and Leach, and Sire, and the whole bunch in turn, averaging about two nights with each one before they put up a kick. Then John tried him with some of the youngsters, but they wouldn't stand for him no more than the others. They all said he was crazy, and they was afraid he'd get violent some night and stick a knife in him. He always insisted on having the water run in the bathtub all night, because he said it reminded him of the sound of the dam near his home. The fellers might get up four or five times a night and shut off the faucet, 
but he'd get right up after him and turn it on again. Carter, a big bush pitcher from Georgia, started a fight with him about it one night, and Elliot pretty near killed him. So the rest of the bunch, when they saw Carter's map next morning, didn't have the nerve to do nothing when it come their turn. Another of his habits was the thing that scared him, though. He'd brought a razor with him, in his pocket, I guess, and he used to do his shaving in the middle of the night. Instead of doing it in the bathroom, he'd lather his face and then come out and stand in front of the looking glass on the dresser. Of course, he'd have all the lights turned on, and that was bad enough when a feller wanted to sleep. But the worst of it was that he'd stop shaving every little while and turn round and stare at the guy who was making a failure of trying to sleep. Then he'd wave his razor around in the air and laugh and begin shaving again. You can imagine how comfortable his roomies felt. John had bought him a suitcase and some clothes and things and charged them up to him. He drew so much dough in advance that he didn't have nothing coming till about June. He never thanked John and he'd wear one shirt and one collar till someone throwed him away. Well, we finally gets to Indianapolis and we was going from there to Cincy to open. The last day in Indianapolis, John come and asked me how I'd like to change roomies. I says I was perfectly satisfied with Larry. Then John says, I wish you'd try, Elliot. The other boys all kicks on him, but he seems to hang around you a lot, and I believe you can get along all right. Why don't you room him alone, I asked. The boss or the hotels won't stand for us rooming alone, says John. You go ahead and try it and see how you make out. If he's too much for you, let me know. But he likes you, and I think he'll be different with a guy who can talk to him like you can. So I says I'd tackle it, because I didn't want to throw John down. When we got to Cincy, they stuck Elliot and me in one room, and we was together till he quit us. I went to the room early that night, because we was going to open next day, and I wanted to feel like something. First thing I done when I got undressed was turn on both faucets in the bathtub. They was making an awful racket when Elliot finally come in about midnight. I was laying awake, and I opened right up on him, I says. Don't shut off that water, because I like to hear it run. Then I turned over and pretended to be asleep. The bug got his clothes off, and then what did he do but go in the bathroom and shut off the water? Then he come back in the room and says... I guess no one's going to tell me what to do in here. But I kept right on pretending to sleep and didn't pay no attention. When he'd got into his bed, I jumped out of mine and turned on all the lights and began stropping my razor. He says, What's coming off? Some of my whiskers, I says. I always shave along about this time. No, you don't, he says. I was in your room one morning down in Louisville, and I've seen you shaving then. Well, I says, the boys tell me you shave in the middle of the night, and I thought if I'd done all the things you do, maybe I'd get so's I could hit like you. You must be superstitious, he says, and I told him I was. I'm a good hitter, he says, and I'd be a good hitter if I never shaved at all. That don't make no difference. Yes, it does, I says. You probably hit good because you shave at night but you'd be a better fielder if you shaved in the morning. You see, I was trying to be just as crazy as him, though that wasn't hardly possible. If that's right, says he, I'll do my shaving in the morning. Because I seen in the papers where the boy says that if I could play the outfield like I can hit, I'd be as good as Cobb. They tell me Cobb gets 20000 a year. No, I says, he don't get that much but he gets about ten times as much as you do. Well, he says, I'm going to be as good as him because I need the money. What do you want with money, I says. He just laughed and didn't say nothing, but from that time on the water didn't run in the bathtub nights and he done his shaving after breakfast. I didn't notice, though, that he looked any better in fielding practice. It rained one day in Cincy, and they trimmed us two out of the other three, but it wasn't Elliot's fault. They had Larry beat 4-1 to one in the ninth inning of the first game. Archer gets on with two out, and John sends my roomie up to hit, though Benton, a left-hander, is working for them. 
The first thing Benton serves up there, Elliot cracks it a mile over Hobby's head. It would have been good for three easy. Only Archer, playing safe, of course, pulls up at third base. Tommy couldn't do nothing, and we was licked. The next day he hits one out of the park off the Indian. But we was way behind, and there was nobody on at the time. We copped the last one without using no pinch hitters. I didn't have no trouble with him nights during the whole series. He come to bed pretty late while we was there, and I told him he'd better not let John catch him at it. What would he do? he says. Find you fifty, I says. He can't find me a dime, he says, because I ain't got it. Then I told him he'd be fined all he had coming if he didn't get in the hotel before midnight. But he just laughed and says he didn't think John had a kick coming so long as he kept busting the ball. Some day you'll go up there and you won't bust it, I says. That'll be an accident, he says. That stopped me and I didn't say nothing. What could you say to a guy who hated himself like that? The accident happened in St. Louis the first day. We needed two runs in the eighth and Sire and Bread was on with two out. John tells Elliot to go up in Pierce's place. The bug goes up, and Griner gives him two bad balls, way outside. I thought they was going to walk him, and it looked like good judgment, because they'd heard what he'd done in Cincy. But no, Griner comes back with a fast one right over, and Elliot pulls it down the right foul line, about two foot foul. He hit it so hard you'd have thought they'd sure walk him then. But Griner gives him another fast one. He slammed it again just as hard, but foul. Then Griner gives him one way outside, and it's two and three. John says on the bench, If they don't walk him now, he'll bust that fence down. I thought the same, and I was sure Griner wouldn't give him nothing to hit. But he come with a curve, and Wrigler calls Elliot out. From where we sat, the last one looked low, and I thought Elliot would make a kick. He come back to the bench smiling. John starts for his position, but stopped and asked the bug what was the matter with that one. Any busher I ever knowed would have said, it was too low, or it was outside, or it was inside. Elliot says, nothing at all. It was right over the middle. Why didn't you bust it then, says John. I was afraid I'd kill somebody, says Elliot, and laughed like a big boob. John was pretty near choking. What are you laughing at, he says. I was thinking of a nickel show I seen in Cincinnati, says the bug. Well, says John, so mad he couldn't hardly see, that show and that laugh will cost you fifty. We got beat, and I wouldn't have blamed John if he'd find him his whole season's pay. Up in the room that night, I told him he'd better cut out that laughing stuff when he was getting trimmed, where he never would have no payday. Then he got confidential. Payday wouldn't do me no good, he says. When I'm all squared up with a club and begin to have a payday, I'll only get a hundred bucks at a time, and I owe that to some of you fellers. I wished we could win the pennant and get in on that World Series dough. Then I'd have a bunch at once. What would you do with a bunch of dough, I asked him. Don't tell nobody, sport, he says. But if I ever get five hundred at once, I'm going to get married. Oh, I says, and who's the lucky girl? She's a girl up in Muskegon, says Elliot, and you're right when you call her lucky. You don't like yourself much, do you, I says. I got reasons to like myself, says he. You'd like yourself too if you could hit em like me. Well, I says, you didn't show me no hitting today. I couldn't hit because I was laughing too hard, says Elliot. What was it you was laughing at, I says. I was laughing at that pitcher, he says. He thought he had something, and he didn't have nothing. He had enough to whiff you with, I says. He didn't have nothing, says he again. I was afraid if I busted one off him, they'd can him, and I couldn't never hit again him no more. Naturally, I didn't have no comeback to that. I just sort of gasped and got ready to go to sleep, but he wasn't through. I wished you could see this bird, he says. What bird, I says. This Dane that's nuts about me, 
he says. Good looker? I asked. No, he says. She ain't no bear for looks. They ain't nothing about her for a guy to rave over till you hear her sing. She sure can holler some. What kind of voice has she got? I asked. A bear, says he. No, I says, I mean, is she a baritone or an air? I don't know, he says. But she's got the loudest voice I ever hear on a woman. She's pretty near got me beat. Can you sing, I says. And I was sorry right afterward that I asked him that question. I guess it must have been bad enough to have the water running night after night and to have him waving that razor around, but that couldn't have been nothing to his singing. Just as soon as I'd pulled that boner, he says, Listen to me! And starts in on silver threads among the gold. Mind you, it was after midnight, and they was guests all around us trying to sleep. There used to be noise enough in our club when we had Hoffman and Sheckard and Richie harmonizing, but this bug's voice was louder and all of theirn combined. We once had a pitcher named Martin Walsh, brother of Big Ed's, and I thought he could have drowned out the subway, but this guy made a boiler factory sound like Dummy Taylor. If the whole hotel wasn't awake when he'd howled the first line, it's a pipe they was when he cut loose, which he'd done when he come to Always young and fair to me. Them words could have been heard easy in East St. Louis. He didn't get no encore from me, but he goes right through it again, or starts to. I knowed something was going to happen before he finished, and something did. The night clerk and the house detective come banging at the door. I let him in, and they had plenty to say. If we made another sound, the whole club would be canned out of the hotel. I tried to salve him, and I says, He won't sing no more. But Elliot swelled up like a poisoned pup. Won't I, he says. I'll sing all I want to. You won't sing in here, says the clerk. They ain't room for my voice in here anyways, he says. I'll go outdoors and sing. And he puts his clothes on and ducks out. I didn't make no attempt to stop him. I heard him bellowing silver threads down the corridor and down the stairs with the clerk and the dick chasing him all the way and telling him to shut up. Well, the guests make a holler the next morning, and the hotel people tells Charlie Williams that he'll either have to let Elliot stay somewhere else or the whole club will have to move. Charlie tells John, and John was thinking of settling the question by releasing Elliot. I guess he'd about made up his mind to do it. But that afternoon, they had us three to one in the ninth, and we got the bases full, with two down and Larry's turn to hit. Elliot had been sitting on the bench saying nothing. Do you think you can hit one today? says John. I can hit one any day, says Elliot. Go up and hit that left-hander then, says John. And remember, there's nothing to laugh at. Sally was working, and working good. But that didn't bother the bug. He cut into one, and it went between oaks and witted like a shot. He come into third standing up, and we was a run to the good. Sally was so sore he kind of forgot himself and took pretty near his full wind-up pitching to Tommy. And what did Elliot do but steal home and get away with it clean? Well, you couldn't can him after that, could you? Charlie gets him a room somewheres, and I was relieved of his company that night. The next evening we beat it for Shy to play about two weeks at home. He didn't tell nobody where he roomed there, and I didn't see nothing of him except out to the park. I asked him what he did with himself nights, and he says, Same as I do on the road. Borrow some dough someplace and go to the nickel shows. You must be stuck on them, I says. Yes, he says. I like the ones where they kill people, because I want to learn how to do it. I may have that job some day. Don't pick on me, I says. Oh, says the bug. You can never tell who I'll pick on. It seemed as if he just couldn't learn nothing about fielding, and finally John told him to keep out of the practice. A ball might hit him in the temple and croak him, says John. But he busted up a couple of games for us at home, beating Pittsburgh once and Cincy once. 
They give me a great big room at the hotel in Pittsburgh. So the fellers picked it out for the poker game. We was playing along about 10 o'clock one night when in come Elliot, the earliest he'd showed up since we'd been rooming together. There was only five of us playing, and Tom asked him to sit in. I'm busted, he says. Can you play poker, I asked him. There's nothing I can't do, he says. Slip me a couple of bucks and I'll show you. So I slipped him a couple of bucks and honestly hoped he'd win, because I knowed he'd never had no dough. Well, Tom dealt him a hand and he picks it up and says, I only got five cards. How many do you want, I says. Oh, he says, if that's all I get, I'll try to make them do. The pot was cracked and raised, and he stood the raise. I says to myself, there goes my two bucks. But no, he comes out with three queens and won the dough. It was only about seven bucks, but you'd have thought it was a million to see him grab it. He laughed like a kid. Guess I can't play this game, he says. And he had me fooled for a minute. I thought he must have been kidding when he complained of only having five cards. He copped another pot right afterward and was sitting there with about eleven bucks in front of him when Jim opens a rudel pot for a buck. I stays and so does Elliot. Him and Jim both drawed one card and I took three. I had kings or queens, I forget which. I didn't help him none, so when Jim bets a buck I throws my hand away. How much can I bet? says the bug. You can raise Jim a buck if you want to, I says. So he bets two dollars. Jim comes back at him. He comes right back at Jim. Jim raises him again, and he tilts Jim right back. Well, when he'd boosted Jim with the last buck he had, Jim says, I'm ready to call. I guess you got me beat. What have you got? I know what I've got, all right, says Elliot. I've got a straight. And he throws his hand down. Sure enough, it was a straight. Eight high. Jim pretty near fainted, and so did I. The bug had started pulling in the dough when Jim stops him. Yeah, wait a minute, says Jim. I thought you had something. I filled up. Then Jim lays down his nine full. You beat me, my guess, says Elliot, and he looked like he'd lost his last friend. Beat you, says Jim. Of course I beat you. What do you think I had? Well, says the bug, I thought you might have a small flush or something. When I regained consciousness, he was begging for two more bucks. What for, I says, to play poker with? You're barred from the game for life. Well, he says, if I can't play no more, I want to go to sleep. And you fellers will have to get out of this room. Did you ever hear a nerve like that? This was the first night he'd come in before twelve, and he orders the bunch out so's he can sleep. We politely suggested to him to go to Brooklyn. Without saying a word, he starts in on his silver threads, and it wasn't two minutes till the game was busted up and the bunch, all but me, was out of there. I'd have beat it too, only he stopped yelling as soon as they'd went. You're some buster, I says. You bust up ball games in the afternoon and poker games at night. Yes, he says. That's my business, busting things. And before I knowed what he was about, he picked up the pitcher of ice water that was on the floor and throwed it out the window, through the glass and all. Right then I give him a plain talking to. I tells him how near he come to getting canned down in St. Louis because he raised so much cane singing in the hotel. But I had to keep my voice in shape, he says. If I ever get do enough to get married, the girl and me will go out singing together. Out where, I asked. Out on the vaudeville circuit, says Elliot. Well, I says, if her voice is like yours, you'll be wasting money if you travel around. Just stay up in Muskegon and we'll hear you all right. I told him he wouldn't never get no dough if he didn't behave himself. 
that even if we got in the World Series, he wouldn't be with us unless he cut out the foolishness. We ain't gonna get in no World Series, he says, and I won't never get a bunch of money at once, so it looks like I couldn't get married this fall. And I told him we played a city series every fall. He never thought of that, and it tickled him to death. I told him the losers always got about 500 apiece, and that we were about due to win it, and get about 800. But, I says, we still got a good chance for the old pennant, and if I was you, I wouldn't give up hope of that yet. Not where John can hear you, anyway. No, he says, we won't win no pennant because he won't let me play a regular. But I don't care so long as we're sure of that city series, though. You ain't sure of it if you don't behave, I says. Well, says he, very serious, I guess I'll behave. And he did, till we made our first eastern trip. Went to Boston first, and that crazy bunch goes out and piles up a three-run lead on us in seven innings the first day. It was the pitcher's turn to lead off in the eighth, so up goes Elliot to bat for him. He kisses the first thing they hands him for three bases, and we says on the bench, now we'll get him, because, you know, a three-run lead wasn't nothing in Boston. Stay right on that bag, John hollers to Elliot. Maybe if John hadn't said nothing to him, everything would have been all right. But when Purdue starts to pitch the first ball to Tommy, Elliot starts to steal home. He's out as far as from here to Seattle. If I'd have been carrying a gun, I'd have shot him right through the heart. As it was, I thought John had kill him with a bat, because he was standing there with a couple of them, waiting for his turn. But I guess John was too stunned to move. He didn't even seem to see Elliot when he went to the bench. After I'd cooled off a little, I says, beat it and get into your clothes before John comes in, then go to the hotel and keep out of sight. When I got up in the room afterward, there was Elliot, looking as innocent and happy as if he'd won fifty bucks with a pair of trays. I thought you might have killed yourself, I says. What for? he says. For that swell play you made, says I. What was the matter within the play? asked Elliot, surprised. It was all right when I done it in St. Louis. Yes, I says, but they was two out in St. Louis, and we wasn't no three runs behind. Well, he says, if it was all right in St. Louis, I don't see why it was wrong here. It's a different climate here, I says, too disgusted to argue with him. I wonder if they'd let me sing in this climate, says Elliot. Nah, I says, don't sing in this hotel, because we don't want to get fired out of here. The eat's too good. All right, he says. I won't sing. But when I starts down to supper, he says, I'm liable to do something worse than sing. He didn't show up in the dining room, and John went to the boxing show after supper, so it looked like him and Elliot wouldn't run into each other till the murder had left John's heart. I was glad of that because a Massachusetts jury might consider it justifiable homicide if one guy croaked another for giving the Boston Club a game. I went down to the corner and had a couple of beers, and then came straight back, intending to hit the hay. The elevator boy had went for a drink or something, and there was two old ladies already waiting in the car when I stepped in. Right along after me comes Elliot. Where's the boy that's supposed to run this car, he says. I told him the boy would be right back. But he says, I can't wait. I'm much too sleepy. And before I could stop him, he'd slam the door, and him and I and the poor old ladies was shooting up. Let us off at the third floor, please, says one of the ladies, her voice kind of shaken. Sorry, madam, says the bug. But this is a express, and we don't stop at no third floor. I grabbed his arm and tried to get him away from the machinery. But he was as strong as an ox, and he throwed me again the side of the car like I was a baby. We went to the top faster than I ever rode in an elevator before, and then we shot down to the bottom, 
hitting the bumper down there so hard I thought we'd be smashed to splinters. The ladies was too scared to make a sound during the first trip, but while we was going up and down the second time, even faster than the first, they begun to scream. I was hollering my head off at him to quit, and he was making more noise than the three of us, pretending he was the locomotive and the whole crew of the train. Don't never ask me how many times we went up and down. The women fainted on the third trip, and I guess I was about as near it as I'll ever get. The elevator boy and the bellhops and the waiters and the night clerk and everybody was jumping around the lobby screaming, but nobody seemed to know how to stop us. Finally, on about the tenth trip, I guess, he slowed down and stopped at the fifth floor where we was rooming. He opened the door and beat it for the room, while I, though I was trembling like a leaf, run the car down to the bottom. The night clerk knowed me pretty well and knowed I wouldn't do nothing like that, so him and I didn't argue, but just got to work together to bring the old women to. While we was doing that, Elliot must have run down the stairs and slipped out of the hotel, because when they sent the officers up to the room after him, he'd blowed. They was going to fire the club out, but Charlie had a good stand-in with Amos, the proprietor, and he fixed it up to let us stay, providing Elliot kept away. The bug didn't show up at the ballpark next day, and we didn't see no more of him till we got off on the Rattler for New York. Charlie and John both balled him, but they gave him a berth, an upper, and we pulled into the Grand Central Station without him having made no effort to wreck the train. I'd studied the thing pretty careful, but hadn't come to no conclusion. I was sure he wasn't no stew, because none of the boys had ever saw him even take a glass of beer, and I could never detect the odor of booze on him. And if he'd been a dope, I'd have knew about it, rooming with him. There wouldn't have been no mystery about it if he'd been a left-hand pitcher, but he wasn't. He wasn't nothing but a whale of a hitter, and he throwed with his right arm. He hit left-handed, of course, but so did Sire and Brid and Schulte and me and John himself, and none of us was violent. I guess he must have been just a plain nut and liable to break out any time. There was a letter waiting for him at New York, and I took it, intending to give it to him at the park, because I didn't think they'd let him room at the hotel. But after breakfast, he come up to the room with his suitcase. It seems he'd promised John and Charlie to be good, and made it so strong they believed him. I give him his letter, which was addressed in a girl's writing, and came from Muskegon. From the girl, I says? Yes, he says and without opening it, he tore it up and throwed it out the window. Had a quarrel, I asked. No, no, he says. But she can't tell me nothing I don't know already. Girls always writes the same junk. I got one from her in Pittsburgh, but I didn't read it. I guess you ain't so stuck on her, I says. He swells up and says, Of course I'm stuck on her. If I wasn't, do you think I'd be going round with this bunch and getting insulted all the time? I'm sticking here because of that series, though, so as I can get hooked. Do you think you'd settle down if he was married, I asked him. Settle down, he says. Sure, I'd settle down. I'd be so happy that I wouldn't have to look for no excitement. Nothing special happened that night, except he come in the room about one o'clock and wake me up by picking up the foot of the bed and dropping it on the floor sudden-like. Give me a key to the room, he says. You must have had a key, I says, or you couldn't have got in. That's right, he says, and beat it to bed. One of the reporters must have told Elliot that John had asked for waivers on him and New York had refused to waive, because next morning he come to me with that dope. New York's going to win this pennant, he says. Well, I says, they will if someone else don't, but what of it? I'm going to play with New York, he says, so as I can get the World Series dough. How are you going to get away from this club, I asked. Just watch me, he says. I'll be with New York before this series is over. Well, the way he goes after the job was original anyway. Rube had one of his good days the day before, and we'd got a trimming. 
but this second day the score was tied up at two runs apiece in the tenth, and Big Jeff had been wobbling for two or three innings. Well, he walks Sire and me with one out, and Mac sends for Matty, who was warmed up and ready. John sticks Elliot in in Brid's place, and the bug pulls one into the right field stand. It's a cinch McGraw thinks well of him then, and might have went after him, if he hadn't went crazy the next afternoon. We're tied up in the ninth, and Maddie's working. John sends Elliot up with the bases choked. But he doesn't go right up to the plate. He walks over to their bench and calls McGraw out. Mac tells us about it afterward. I can bust up this game right here, says Elliot. Go ahead, says Mac. But be careful he don't whiff you. Then the bug pulls it. If I whiff, he says, will you get me on your club? Sure, says Mac, just as anybody would. By this time, Bill Clem was hollering about the delay. So up goes Elliot and gives the worst burlesque on trying to hit that you ever see. Matty throws one a mile outside and high, and the bug swings like it was right over the heart. Then Matty throws one at him, and he ducks out of the way, but swings just the same. Matty must have been wise by this time, for he pitches one so far outside that the chief almost has to go to the coacher's box after it. Elliot takes his third healthy and runs through the field down to the clubhouse. We got beat in the 11th, and when we went into dress, he has his street clothes on. Soon as he's seen John come and he says, I gotta see McGraw, and he beat it. John was going to the fights that night, but before he leaves the hotel, he had waivers on Elliot from everybody and had sold them to Atlanta. And, says John, I don't care if they pay for him or not. My roomie blows in about nine and got the letter from John out of his box. He was going to tear it up, but I told him there was news in it. He opens it and reads where he's sold. I was still sore at him, so I says, Thought you was going to get on the New York club. No, he says, I got turned down cold. McGraw says he wouldn't have me in his club. He says he'd had Charlie Faust, and that was enough for him. He had a kind of crazy look in his eyes, so when he starts up to the room, I follows him. What are you going to do now, I says. I'm going to sell this ticket to Atlanta, he says, and go back to Muskegon where I belong. I'll help you pack, I says. No, says the bug. I come into this league with this suit of clothes and a collar. They can have the rest of it. Then he sits down on the bed and begins to cry like a baby. No series, no for me, he blubbers. And no wedding bells. My girl will die when she hears about it. Of course, that made me feel kind of rotten. And I says, brace up, boy. The best thing you can do is go to Atlanta and try hard. You'll be up here again next year. You can't tell me where to go, he says and he wasn't crying no more. I'll go where I please, and I'm liable to take you with me. I didn't want no argument, so I kept still. Pretty soon he goes up to the looking glass and stares at himself for five minutes. Then all of a sudden he hauls off and takes a wallop at his reflection in the glass. Naturally he smashed the glass all to pieces, and he cut his hand something awful. Without looking at it, he come over to me and says... Well, goodbye, sport, and holds out his other hand to shake. When I starts to shake with him, he smears his bloody hand all over my map. And he laughed like a wild man and run out of the room and out of the hotel. Well, boys, my sleep was broke up for the rest of the season. It might have been because I was used to sleeping in all kinds of racket and excitement and couldn't stand for the quiet after he'd went. Or it might have been because I kept thinking about him and feeling sorry for him. I often wondered if he'd settle down and be something if he could get married, and finally I got to believe he would. So when we was dividing the city series, though, I was thinking of him and the girl. Our share of the money, the losers as usual, 
was 12,760 bucks or something like that. They was 21 of us, and that meant 607 bucks apiece. We was just going to cut it up that way when I says, why not give a divvy to poor old Elliot? About 15 of them at once told me that I was crazy. You see, when he got canned, he owed everybody in the club. I guess he'd stuck me for the most, about 70 bucks, but I didn't care nothing about that. I knowed he hadn't never reported to Atlanta, and I thought he was probably busted, and a bunch of money might make things all right for him and the other songbird. I made quite a speech to the fellers, telling him how he'd cried when he left us, and how his heart had been set on getting married on the series, though. I made it so strong that they finally fell for it. Our shares was cut to 580 apiece, and John sent him a check for a full share. For a while, I was kind of worried about what I did. I didn't know if I was doing right by the girl to give him the chance to marry her. He told me she was stuck on him, and that's the only excuse I had for trying to fix it up between them. But believe me, if she was my sister or a friend of mine, I'd just as soon have had her manage the Cincinnati club as marry that bird. I thought to myself, if she's all right, she'll take acid in a month and it'll be my fault. But if she's really stuck on him, they must be something wrong with her, too. So what's the difference? Then along comes this letter that I told you about. It's from some friend of his up there, and there's a note from him. I'll read them to you, and then I gotta beat it for the station. Dear Sir, They have got poor Elliot locked up, and they are gonna take him to the asylum at Kalamazoo. He thanks you for the check, and we will use the money to see that he is made comfortable. When the poor boy came back here, he found that his girl was married to Joe Bishop, who runs a soda fountain. She had wrote to him about it, but he did not read her letters. The news drove him crazy, poor boy, and he went to the place where they was living with a baseball bat and very near killed them both. Then he marched down the street singing silver threads among the gold at the top of his voice. They was gonna send him to prison for assault with a tent to kill, but the jury decided he was crazy. He wants to thank you again for the money. Yours truly, Jim... I can't make out his last name, but it don't make no difference. Now I'll read you his note. Old Rumi, I was at bat twice and made two hits but I guess I did not meet them square. They tell me they are both alive yet, which I did not mean them to be. I hope they got good curveball pitchers where I am going. I sure can bust them curves, can I, sport? Yours, B. Elliot. P.S. The B stands for Buster. That's all of it, fellers. And you can see I had some excuse for not hitting. You can also see why I ain't never gonna room with no bug again. Not for John or nobody else. End of My Roomie by Ring Lardner Read by Rick Rodstrom